I won't say any more on this because we are delighted to uh, get the views and perspectives of how to make sustainable lifestyles the norm from our great uh, panelists here. So, firstly, I'm delighted to welcome Saroja Sarandaram, who's the Executive Director of the Citizen uh, Consumer and Civic Action Group, CAG, from India. We also have uh, Anya Philip, who is the President of the Danish Consumer Council. We have Dr. Joseph Asanka, who is the Chief Executive of Afrobarometer. Thank you all so much for participating in this discussion. And I want to open up. You've just seen a few snapshots of what Consumers International has been uncovering. But what do you believe are the key influences on households towards living more sustainably? And I'd like to ask this to uh, Dr. Joseph first. All right, thank you so much. Um, and thanks to Consumer International for inviting Afrobarometer to this session. Um, so Afrobarometer is a Pan-African public opinion survey. We conduct public attitude surveys across the continent. And at the moment, we are in about 40 countries on the continent. And we ask people about their experiences of governance, the economy, living conditions, including climate change. And I'm glad that you presented this data about people's views on you know, the energy transition or whether it is green transition. I do think that some of the work we do reflect this. And if I had three hours with you, I would have shown you lots and lots of data in terms of how people's citizens actually experience um, climate change and what they are saying about it. But to your question, I think I want to address just two things. What is it that is influencing people's behavior in terms of changing their lifestyles? So the first thing, I mean, across the continent, when we have interviewed in 39 countries, over 54,000 African citizens, what we have learned is the effects of climate change is making people begin to feel that there's a need to change their lifestyles. First of all, across many countries, we have large majorities telling us that the incidence of floods and droughts have become more severe recently. And because of these experiences, we see citizens becoming more and more tolerant towards government action to limit climate change. What they want their governments to do is to take immediate steps to limit the effects of climate change. And so those effects are beginning to create conditions on the continent where citizens are ready to sacrifice to make sure that government's interventions can lead to better living style for them and, of course, securing the future. In particular, they are eager to see this done, even if it comes at a cost. If it comes at a cost in terms of inconveniences or that there are some job losses, people are willing to, to accept that. The second thing that is influencing people's behavior, which is an unfortunate situation but seems to be positive, is access to some services. So across the continent, in 39 countries that we've surveyed, only about half say that they have access to electricity supply. So power supply is a problem on the continent. But when we ask what are the alternative sources of power, solar comes up as a top. So about 62% of those who say they don't have access to reliable power say that the alternative for them is solar. And I do think this also provides an opportunity for governments because it then means that subsidizing solar energy is likely to drive more people into that sector which can lead to more sustainable living. And I do think that there's an opportunity for policy intervention in that space. Thanks. Thank you, Joseph. Anya, do you have something to come in to say? Well, yeah, it works. Uh, nice to be here together with all of you. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's uh, to make it very short what is needed to influence the daily life. It's awareness, it's willingness, it's uh, availability, uh, practicality, and then it's all the basic structures in society, laws, rules, etc., that needs to be in place. So uh, to just make a title on what is needed is to make the sustainable choice the easy choice and to go out in daily life and see how that is met. So you need the, this whole cultural society understanding of the need. You mentioned what uh, showed it to people here in Africa. Um, it has also become awareness in, in the Western or Scandinavian part of the world where I come from. And uh, actually nearly everybody, 97% in Denmark, when we make our surveys, 
would like the green transition and they would like to support. But another answer in our surveys is that eight or nine out of ten people, they don't know how. Mm. So you need to meet the sustainable choice where you have your daily um, shopping or whatever you're doing. This needs to be maybe a little more extensive, but not extremely more expensive um, to buy that product, which is more sustainable than the other one. So um, one solution is to put a, like a CO2 tax. Uh, what we say is that the polluter pays. So the most expensive product is also the most uh, polluting product. So that kind of uh, tools, and I have much more, uh, I could give much many more examples if uh, we take another round, but this just to start the conversation. Excellent, and Saroja, um, building on what Anya has said, do you see uh, a difference between support for sustainable living and ability for people to, to live sustainably in, in India as well? Uh, sorry, I didn't get your question. Support for sustainability and? A and being able to, to live uh, sustainably, able to action that sustainable yeah. living. Yeah. So there is a challenge there actually, because increasingly we are seeing people who do want to lead a sustainable lifestyle, but then there are challenges around availability, accessibility and affordability, because cost factor, again, when you talk about sustainable products, they are expensive and not many people are able to afford and availability is also a challenge and may other, another major issue is about the greenwashing of these products. So this is another challenge that consumers are facing today. So I think it's very important, we, like we, uh, consumers need the support of the governments and the businesses to ensure that they are able to see the ecosystem should be such that it is easily navigable uh, for the consumer to access these products. At the same time, like the cost factor should be such that they are, and the product should be available by default. So that is also another, like I should not go searching for something which actually acts as a deterrent to some extent. So I think we need to make sure that the products are readily available products, um, whatever we are looking at, what, what is needed in our daily life and also schemes by the government, subsidies, as mentioned by my friend earlier. So when we are talking about, like if a person is expected to switch to renewable energy, then subsidies for those which will actually attract the consumer, incentivizing sustainable products that will actually uh, encourage the consumer to move, to move towards sustainable products and sustainable living and also in the infrastructure when we talk about mobility, sustainable mobility. So we need the infrastructure, public transport, last mile connectivity and uh, uh, like footpaths, cycling paths, all these should be provided so that the consumer can make that change very easily. It's there before him and he is able to do that. Today, uh, today we are not seeing that and we would like that to be there for the consumer so that he or she is able to make uh, an easy choice of moving towards a sustainable lifestyle. Thank you. And, and do you feel that a, a one-size-fits-all approach is uh, right, or do you feel that there are different groups of consumers that need different interventions? So, younger consumers, what are their aspirations, uh, and how do they differ from different generations? Or what about financially stable consumers that may not be so sustainably driven, but could be nudged, persuaded a little bit to, to do more? What, what are your views on that? Well, uh, crossing ages and different consumer groups, we see the same wish, actually. Uh, but of course, you have some limitations if you are not very rich and you just... But it's needed that you can see the result of your choice. So, for example, in Denmark, we have been working very hard to get a climate labeling on food. Um, so you can actually look in your basket and see, okay, there's so much in the red traffic light and so much in the green traffic light, because people need this kind of uh, understanding. But um, uh, when, you, when economy follows the sustainability, when the most expensive product 
is also the most polluting product, then you will get the change. We could see that when uh, taxes went down on electric cars in Denmark, suddenly we got the whole transition, so now everybody is buying electric cars. But you need this push from the government side to really make uh, an effort. Maybe just to add to that, especially when it comes to young consumers, I do think sustainable banking can be one way to look at this, because young consumers have this increasingly thinking of the environment and do want to invest in green areas. And so if savings accounts, like if young people are persuaded to say, these providers of savings accounts do invest their resources in green areas, then you can actually entice young consumers to move their savings into banking service providers who actually invest in green technology or green areas in a way that gives that momentum to that area. So there's more investment in green areas and also people feel like they are putting their money in places where they are contributing to environmental sustainability. That's fascinating. You mentioned uh, sustainable finance or banking. Uh, we have seen some research that indicates that this is the number one intervention that consumers can make to direct their finance would have such a great, great impact, more so than going vegetarian or cutting flights. But Sereja, what, what are your views and thoughts on, on this? So to add to what the other panelists said, maybe appeal to their character by making sustainability more uh, desirable stylish in some manner so that the younger generation are attracted and want to uh, uh, change behavior the, and at the same time actually engaging them with uh, engaging with them on the concepts of uh, uh, personal impact and uh, su sufficiency basically in uh, talking to them about uh, this is like saying this is enough you don't need to go overboard so things like that might actually, and of course the cost factor plays an important role because if products are available at a lesser cost and if they are sustainable, I'm sure uh, across the board, be it the younger generation or uh, financially stable or any other consumer would uh, prefer to go for such uh, products. To give another example um, is food waste. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in my part of the world, uh, one third of all the produced food is wasted. And that is really sickening to, uh, to think about. So we started a large campaign uh, many years ago to start ma making the thought for consumers that food waste is money waste. And we also um, went into the um, business part and, and got them the same message. And that has turned some, some things, in, at least in Denmark, to think, oh, this is actually money I throw out in my um, uh, garbage, garbage uh, bin. Um, and especially seeing through the crisis we are going through now with the raising prices and people have a hard time paying for their daily goods, then uh, this food waste uh, has uh, really come on top of the mind. So a win-win for, for consumers. It's saving money, saving, uh, saving the planet at the same time. Um, we're touching upon here what we need businesses to do. Um, and I'd love to get some further reflections. What, what would you ask businesses to, to do more to support consumers to live more sustainably? Yeah, well, I have many suggestions. <laughs> uh, and one thing is that um, producers should really make products that have a long lifespan. The most polluting part of a product's uh, life is in the production phase. So, and it's important in this discussion not to blame only consumers. It's just as much the producers that need to think in the same way. So long life to uh, products, they should be, st be designed so you can actually repair them. It's a huge problem in my part of the world that you can't repair products. So you throw them out. I mean, a dishwasher that has lived three years, it's thrown out instead of repairing it. It's also sickening. And then the businesses should make their 
streams of production and delivering, so you can get all the resources circulated. And society, of course, you need to be able to sort your waste and to uh, reuse your waste. There's a good business uh, potential in seeing waste again as, uh, as money. So that's one thing. And also when you make your product, design your product, don't use uh, bad chemicals that will pollute our environment, pollute our bodies, etc. Um, and then if you have bad chemistry in it, you can't recirculate the resources. So that's also um, an answer. Then I was just in a, a debate like this with IKEA. I mean, they are all over the world now. And um, they actually start thinking in this way. And they have made a new product, a new project where they buy back uh, used uh, IKEA furniture uh, when the consumer don't want them anymore. So if they can also collect these furniture and get it recycled, that's uh, it's, it's a large global player who can show us how to make these new streams of resources. So, uh, and then uh, about labeling to inform consumers about products and what they contain and how sustainable they are and so on. Don't invent your own labels because consumers can't navigate in 100 different labels. So a few um, maybe globally controlled labeling so we can all understand what, how we should read a, a product. So businesses. Excellent. So we've got circular economy, we've got labeling. Joseph. Uh, yeah, I, like I just wanted add? to add that, I mean, one of our talk about government uh, sort of subsidies in terms of granting, making it easier for people to access greener ways of living, especially when it comes to electric vehicles. I do think that businesses can play a role. Investing in technology that ensures that the cost of electric vehicles, for example, is much lower and it gets lower and lower over time. So the government intervention at least the subsidies that may be provided will be much lower, which would also incentivize governments to want to do that. So some kind of technological innovation that can allow for electric vehicles. And of course, young people are, would see these as more fashionable vehicles because they are cleaner, they are quieter when you're riding. And so it's, it's a win-win situation if businesses can invest in technology that brings down the cost of electric vehicles, for example. And Sarosia. Uh, I think they have covered most of what I wanted to say, but uh, I would like to add, uh, like they could consider um, uh, like um, coming up with third party certification of these products, uh, sustainable products, so that consumer is assured that they are not uh, exploited in the marketplace. So this is uh, something they could consider and they ensure cost effectiveness of the products so that um, uh, it, like, it is easily available to the consumer. So in addition to what they have said, I would like to add these two points. Mm. Yeah. Excellent, and we've touched upon, it, it's not just businesses that are going to be able to support consumers. We need that government support, that government intervention in the marketplace. What, what would you say is the, the number one recommendation to, to governments? <laughs> Should I start? Well, number one, um, hmm. get the whole regulatory framework in place so the sustainable choice is the easy choice. Um, and that includes that you phase out all the bad products, all the bottom products should be phased out. They shouldn't be available at all. Um, we, we touched upon the CO2 tax. That's also a government thing mm -hmm. to make the sustainable choice the more cheaper choice. Um, if all new regulation went through a screening process uh, on the sustainable goals, uh, to look on the sustainable goals when you propose new regulation and see do we harm the sustainable goals by implementing this law that could be uh, an action point. Um, and then I would say binding rules, not voluntary rules for businesses. Um, it's just needed. We've seen it with greenwashing, as you mentioned. Yeah. Saroja. So I, I would say that 
So subsidies and all, um, as far as uh, renewables go, uh, is the role played by the government in India. So I think, um, uh, like, government should look at subsidizing um, such sustainable options available to consumers so that uh, it incentivizes consumers to move towards sustainable choices. And uh, in addition to that, the infrastructure available, um, and the infrastructure should be made available to the consumers so that they are able to um, move towards sustainable options. And, um, uh, and also, uh, I think we need to have strong policies in place and effective implementation of those policies, which are very important. For example, the EPR, and uh, there are several other policies where, uh, which are already in place where enforcement, uh, there, is a, there, is, there are issues around enforcement, and we also need to have more policies that talk about sustainability, that ensures uh, like, that sustainability is the topmost priority for the country, and also implementation and enforcement, which are most needed. Thank you. And Joseph, would you like to add to that? Right, so just one point. This one on the, in the context of the African uh, continent, I do think there is general sentiment across the continent, especially in countries that we work in, that people are willing to accept some inconveniences if policy changes will lead to limiting the effects of climate change. And I think when governments are intervening in this space with policies that may cause inconveniences, it shouldn't be a fear because the conditions on the ground are favorable for some policy in their intervention that can lead to limiting climate change, but only if citizens are convinced that it will limit the effects of climate change. And so it will be a combination of education, especially if a policy is going to have negative implications, but that the positive impact of the climate on the climate change is outweighs the negative implications for citizens, they will be more willing to accept it, but we do need to have effective education to make sure that citizens come along as we implement these policies. Fantastic, so every government policy needs to do a test, a check that it's going to be supporting sustainability, sustainable living, but we also need to look at the tax and the subsidy system, infrastructure, and a number of other recommendations. And I think I'd just like to thank you all as an excellent panel because we, the next panel that I'm going to invite to the stage are representatives of some of those uh, businesses and governments and global institutions that can potentially help deliver some of this change. So, would you join me in thanking the, this panel and I'd like to invite up the next panel to the stage. Thank you. And whilst uh, we do this swap around, I'd love to get some views and reflections from you in the audience. So we've got time for one or two points, views, questions, if anyone would like to raise their hand. Just briefly two points. Uh, one is what Anya had mentioned. The product should have long life and we should repair it and use it like. But when it comes to the government policy, always it is uh, contradictory. For example, in India recently, we have announced a right to repair policy. You know, com consumers should give the technical know-how how to repair a product, and they have the right. But the main challenge is, after an year or so, the parts are not available in the market. You know, the manufacturers keep changing the model, and they will say, sorry, this, this model is not available. So that at the same time, the government is contradicting. A year uh, in advance, we have announced a scrapping policy. That means any uh, vehicle, motor vehicle, more than 10 years or 15 years, you need to scrap that. And if you go to buy a new vehicle, you will get a lot of incentives, tax reduction, and things like that. Otherwise, the tax keep on going. So there are contradictions in that. On one side, it is say, so how we should deal? Because many times, the government don't want to annoy the manufacturers or anything. So they are reluctant to take this uh, uh, policy. Second thing, what uh, Saroja had uh, uh, mentioned, anything sustainable product means, at least in our country, the cost is almost three times more. Organic products in the country, the normal chemical products, it is three times. Uh, potato, one kg, 10 rupees. Organic potato is 30 rupees. 
and the consumers also like you know the cost is added to that and pass on to the the uh, consumers so they look many consumer survey shows they say okay this sustainability labeling everything is good but when it comes to buy the product they look only at the cost so there should be uh, you know same in sweden and all i have seen that the chemical products and the organic products maybe few cents difference is there like you know so if it is huge reference that is uh, uh, making the consumers uh, 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 going away from those uh, sustainable products so we need to see how we can bring this sustainable product at the same cost of the other product thank you thank you thank you and i think there's a hand up next to you Thank you, my name is Arnau and I work for Anktan. And I'd like to underscore what Saroja was saying about making the sustainable consumption the priority for government. We at Anktan host the World Consumer Protection Map and see that only 30% of legislation of consumer protection includes some kind of reference to sustainability. And although it doesn't mean that everything has to be in the law, it is indicative that governments have some kind of regulatory capture by the business community. So there needs to be grit um, by policymakers to make that a priority in, in government action. And I think it is a good way for consumer advocacy groups to come up with some kind of consumers' rights for sustainable development that can bring more attention or more um, convincing to policymakers to make that the priority. Thank you. Fantastic. I think we've got time for one more question, so, so maybe this lady over here. Hi, my name is Linda Kimilu. I'm from Strathmore University, and I had a question. Um, heavily on the last panelist, they spoke about having government intervention and su subsidies and for green products. But then when you look at the policy by especially our government, it takes a really long time for them to even come up with a policy. So if the next panel could probably discuss uh, things aside from the government policies that we would do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so we've got a great sort of selection of taxes and subsidies and uh, government policies that, and, and actions for consumer groups as well to, to try and develop some type of campaign linking consumer rights and sustainable living. And then this challenge that policy can take a long, long time to, to be implemented. So I'm delighted to be joined by another brilliant panel here today. So we have Mamadou uh, from, uh, from Vodacom, uh, a business uh, based in, in Africa. We have uh, Dr. Anandita Amita from CERC, but also um, representing the Indian government for a program that you're working with. And then we have Sh uh, Sheila Agawar Khan, who is the Director, Industry and Economy Division of the United Nations Environment Program. Thank you all so much for joining for this session. And I've got a, a, you've heard what the first panel were talking about, and we've had lots of recommendations and ideas from businesses, and you've just heard some of the views in, uh, from the audience. One question that was uh, coming up um, was around looking at the choices available to consumers. Um, green defaults, I think, came up. Uh, choice editing came up. Uh, and maybe, Mamadou, if I go to you first, what, what is the balance between, uh, what's the balance to strike between choice editing and providing lots of choice? Or is this not quite the right question to, to address? Okay, uh, thanks, Peter. I am very happy to be here, and uh, thanks for uh, Consumer International for inviting uh, Vodacom, which put really, you know, sustainability in the core of its uh, business. So in the context of, uh, of Africa, so we can say that, uh, first of all, we have the issue of uh, affordability, affordability, accessibility, and so forth, because we have uh, a, a big chunk of the population that still doesn't have access to, 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 to basic services. So we are driving inclusion, and after this inclusion, so drive also for affordability, so meaning that uh, uh, making sure that all segments of, of the, uh, the population so can uh, afford uh, so having access to, to internet or to, or to basic services. Uh, and, and that's why we, okay, uh, we, do, we use our tools, our IoT tools, our data, 
so that to give really uh, tailored uh, services you know, to, the, uh, to the population. I have seen that uh, you mentioned in the report, report that 87% of uh, consumer talk about you know, the cost of living. So we as business, as we have consumer, consumers in the center of our, our business, so it's our duty also to have uh, solutions so to uh, make life you know, easier, more af affordable. Uh, in uh, you know, for example, having device financing uh, solutions, uh, also having making sure that everybody have access, you know, to uh, uh, to, to to devices and, uh, uh, for example, to to make sure that uh, people can afford, they have access, you know, to to services. This is basic. So. And then, uh, so one thing is that I heard in th in this panel is that uh, we should not really also make a difference or antagonize, you know, sustainability and affordability. I, we believe that uh, sustainability should come as a default, should not be like uh, uh, luxury or something, or come as extra cost. So that's why in all our pro processes, so we put sustainability in the core of the business. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Who would like to come in next, Anandita? Thank you for the opportunity uh, to present my views here today. I would just uh, like to add uh, to what uh, Mamadou said. Uh, and I would say there's a very delicate balance to be striked between providing choice and between choice editing. And uh, somewhere I would link this to consumer behavior as well. Uh, conscious, responsible consumer behavior is a long process, though we are seeing a massive change as indicated by your survey, but still we have a long way to go. And we have all heard about the various challenges. And given inflationary pressures, it's more about saving money than saving the planet. So, given these challenges, and I'm not elaborating on the challenges as we have all heard, availability, accessibility, and uh, the whole range, given these challenges, certain products which have a negative, irreversible impact on the environment should definitely not be an option for choice. For example, yesterday we had a session on single-use plastics, which should definitely not be a choice. Another process, I would say, is indiscriminate use of pesticides in our fields, which harms not only the environment, the biodiversity, the soil, it also pollutes the groundwater, it also has tremendous negative impact on the health. So such products and processes which has irreversible negative effect on the environment should definitely not be an option for choice. And uh, of course uh, now since, like I mentioned, uh, that the shift will take a while, so maybe certain products and processes which has a minimal effect on the environment can be given as a choice to the consumers. Shidi, would you like to come in on this? So sustainability shouldn't be a rich person's choice. It should be available to everyone. And the challenge we have today is sustainable products or healthy products have become an issue which says, okay, the wealthy consumer has access to this. And I think there's a role for consumer bodies to engage with governments to say what are the kind of policy and regulatory space that they're going to undertake to make sure there's a level playing field for products to be able to reach the market at the same cost as unsustainable products. I was recently in Bonn in the negotiations on the global chemicals framework, and what was really sad to see was sustainability at some points was seen as, okay, do I make my choice on having the product, so food product, or is it about, you know, sustainability? So highly hazardous pesticides was a very hot topic under discussion, 
where some stakeholders were saying, well, can you ban them by 2030 or by 2035? And the issue there was, well, you have to have food security. And some of these products, these food products cannot be grown without highly hazardous pesticides. But I would have said, well, actually, you have a growing market right now, growing where researchers are looking at alternative chemicals. And it's, to me, a place where government have to play a role in incentivizing the alternatives and the green chemicals to be able to much faster replace highly hazardous pesticides, because it shouldn't be a choice of planet versus cost, right? My pocket mm. versus the planet, it should actually also has a very serious health impact. And a lot of consumers are not aware that sustainability is not just the environment, but human health, because you're ingesting, putting products on your skin, you're, you're wearing things that have chemicals in it. And so it's, I think, a space that governments have to engage in very seriously to see how does environment, human health, and product availability be on the table in a way that doesn't privilege others over another. Absolutely. It shouldn't be a choice down to consumers. So how can we ensure that decision-making is based on behavioral insights, what people are really experiencing in the marketplace and what do they really need? What, what would you say um, would be one way that we could do that? So you're saying how to use... How, how can we ensure policy decision-making or even business decision-making is underpinned by uh, behavioral insights? So I would say, so two places maybe. One is consumer information. And right now the consumer, even if you want to have a choice that is more sustainable or more healthy, you're bombarded with information about ingredients in your product without really understanding what it means. So uh, the French have their um, Nutra, uh, I forget uh, the, ra the rating system for you know, whether your product has a lot of sugar or not. Actually, you could do the same for environment and health issues where you can see what is the impact of this product on me, and not just the environment. And so it needs a standardized way of looking at it. I think our previous panel also spoke to this. Is can we have a global standard out there which has consumer information that has aggregate data that allows us to be able to look at this across the board? And two, what is the policy and regulatory change to make sure that we are not subsidizing industries that have a problem in terms of you know, giving them a competitive edge? How do we create a level playing field for all those who are out there? So that, uh, to me, that would be actually how you influence consumer behavior because if I have the product information and I have the right choices to be able to make, because cost is not going to make, give me the choice, but actually create a level playing field for all of industry's products, then the consumer has the opportunity to change and to make an informed decision. Yes, and we touched upon some of this within the Green Claim session yesterday, and um, I think one of the speakers mentioned it's about usability for the consumer and a comparability, so the consumers can compare different products. Mamadou, what do you think of, of, no. of a labeling system, no. a universal uh, labeling system? No, first, I, f I think that, um, so in the co again, in the context of, uh, of Africa, there are a lot of things to be done in terms of regulations. Yeah. We have seen that uh, at AU level, so there are actions being done you know, in terms of privacy, uh, in terms of uh, security, because uh, if I can mention that here, he, since yesterday, one team came, you know, more often is about security, mm. yeah, about data privacy. So we know, for example, at African level, we have uh, this Malabo Convention, which was passed like uh, in 2014, but only being implemented now, like uh, uh, 10 years later. Yeah, so a lot of slowness, a lot of bureaucracy, and I think there is something to be done to fast track. Now to implement all these legislations, you know, in country, this is another, another challenge because of funding issues, because of knowledge issues, because of awareness issues, and I think also that's where also consumer associations, government, and also business can play a role by, for example, uh, uh, exchanging best practices. For example, if in one country specifically, 
So they have uh, problems implementing legislation. Maybe there is best practices in other countries that we can really, uh, you know, bench, uh, you know, uh, bank on. So this is in one in one side, and on another side. So you mentioned government uh, subsidies. Okay, in some cases subsidies can can help. In other in other cases, what we are just for example, asking for the government is not to consider sustainability as also luxury. So, for example, taxation. Uh, we can see that in many countries, uh, solar panels or any devices related, you know, to make the planet clean and so forth, so are subject to heavy taxation because it's considered as as uh, same as sin, you know, products like beer and, and uh, or cigarette and so forth. So there should be a change of mindset in the at the government level, at least, not to tax, you know, all the equipments and so forth, uh, which are contributing to make our uh, planet, you know, cleaner. Yeah. Great, great points, um, and. And Adita, um, what, what would you say are the pr priority interventions to enable sustainable living for consumers, building on your work in, in India? Well, uh, talking about businesses, uh, we've all heard in the previous panel that what are the interventions uh, they can take. Uh, I would just like to add to that, uh, it doesn't need the present is infrastructure to be overhauled or you know a lot of investments little tweaking here and there can uh, do the job like sourcing renewable um, materials for their products to be manufactured or uh, uh, you know their operations to be powered by low carbon uh, emission uh, energy and coming up with uh, say lower carbon footprint products so uh, these can be uh, you know done very well without having huge investments in the sector secondly uh, as for governments uh, i would like to uh, bring forward uh, you know certain uh, policies and uh, interventions in context of india um, we uh, at India, uh, there is this mission life that has been introduced by our Honorable Prime Minister at the COP26 at Glasgow, which encourages individuals with very simple everyday actions. They can, uh, you know, bring about collectively bring about a massive change that can address the climate crisis. And uh, of course, uh, this is very relevant. Uh, we've already talked about businesses and uh, uh, government policies, but uh, this individual action points, you, you mentioned that there's a to-do gap. Though the consumers are willing to take that extra mile to embrace sustainable uh, lifestyles, but they do not actually know exactly how they can go about it, what are the little actions they can take uh, to ensure, you know. So uh, Mission Life, uh, under seven broad categories, uh, there are 75 uh, action points, which are very simple uh, uh, action points given here. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I have this literature here for anybody who wants to see. And uh, these changes can happen right away. You can just uh, start doing it today itself, like take the stairs instead of elevators. And I mean, those are such simple action uh, points given. And this, when you, you know, uh, practiced as uh, by an individual, by the community, and uh, globally, would make a major mark in addressing the climate uh, change. So this is uh, one uh, initiative by the government. Secondly, uh, there is green skill development programs that are happening in India. Most uh, vocational uh, programs emphasize on the technical skills or uh, mechanical skills, but nobody talks about green skilling. So, uh, 
green skilling is the need of the hour wherein in every uh, walk of life in every uh, industry or in every uh, work that you do there is always a scope for either to save energy save water uh, reduce waste so uh, green skilling the youth will go a long way in ensuring that uh, you know our uh, processes are uh, moving towards sustainability so uh, these are the two uh, interventions by the government in India uh, to bring about a long-term change and uh, Mission Life and GSTP can be replicated globally and if done, uh, I think it will make a major impact. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Maybe you? I can ask maybe Anita with the uh, experience of, of India about you know, the uh, circularity of, of devices. Because I think also one of uh, the elements, one of the key focus for business and also for government is also to ensure that, okay, uh, the population can use, you know, devices, you know, with extended uh, lifespan. And make sure also, uh, this is not only good for, for the planet as, as such, but also it's good for the consumers themselves, yeah? Because it saves on their uh, purchasing power. I say it's one of the main concern of, 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 the, uh, of, of the consumers. So how do we make sure that, you know, this uh, circular economy, this, uh, you know, extending lifespan of, uh, of devices and defending the purchasing power of the population so I think it's a win-win uh, situation for, 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 for all stakeholders, I, be, I believe. Do, do you want to answer that, Anandita? How, how do you make it um, uh, acceptable for, for consumers, uh, more circular economy principles? Oh, sorry, uh, can I uh, have the question again? Well, Mamadou, would you like to... Just about uh, you know, circularity of, uh, of devices and how to make sure that devices, so the lifespan of devices is, uh, for example, using uh, refurbished uh, devices, for, for, for example, uh, and making sure uh, that the systems are in place, you know, so that, okay, uh, we have a second life of you know, those devices so that, you know, the population can benefit for, from it. I think this is more relevant to the businesses uh, than for the consumers because uh, circular economy primarily would uh, begin from the, at the production end, correct? If you're making products that are easily repairable and, uh, you know, it has an extended uh, product lifespan, I think uh, that would uh, be, uh, you know, more helpful for the consumers. And I think uh, Anya in the previous uh, panel has uh, uh, elaborated on how uh, the, you know, dishwashers and all after three months of use have, you know, so it's, the problem is basically in the design or uh, so the businesses, I guess, uh, has to play a role in this in devising uh, or uh, making products uh, with an extended uh, lifespan and uh, which, you know, can be uh, used repeatedly. Sheila, do you want to come in on this? I was just going to say that, you know, so it's very interesting to learn and see the movement from India on mission life and pushing consumers to, to think through that. And I think your question points to the need for government then to look and see how do you have repairability in a way that the onus is not on the consumer, consumer. but that the producer is mandated mm. by government to make sure that if its product is going to go obsolete, Correct. it cannot simply be allowed to go obsolete in, the in two years. Correct. Either they have to replace it or they have to take back the equipment from the consumer so that then the consumer either gets a reduced cost or whatever, but then the producer will design for disassembly and to reuse those materials and also not just have it just dumped once it's returned. So to me, yeah, something like Mission Life is very important and critical, but coupled with government action to make sure that at the producer level, um, 
and there's enough choices out there for the consumer to make that informed choice because I can just see myself having the dishwasher mm -hmm. and not knowing that it's actually going to go you know, not work in three years, and then I'm, I'm stuck as a consumer. So I feel pressured that sometimes I look as a consumer, and even though I make as many choices as I can, the onus cannot just be on myself, but also on what governments do to make sure producers I are I absolutely their agree with you, and I always uh, say that uh, sustainability is everyone's business. It's not just the consumers, it's, it's a effort by everybody in the marketplace, be it government, policies, businesses, and the consumers. I, um, this is just to fill the to-do gap, you know, because uh, consumers want to make the shift today, but they don't know how. So these very simple, actionable points will help the consumers make that difference and these are very very uh, easy to follow uh, tips and i think today individual uh, efforts individual and community efforts uh, well in the past uh, at the macro level lot of interventions have been taken uh, you know in terms of uh, by the government uh, by policies regulations uh, of course enforcement is an issue but these macro level interventions are taking a bit of time to uh, you know bring about the desired change so i guess this is now time for the micro level at the individual level at the community level at the level of institutions to bring about this change and collectively i think we all can make a difference and uh, the target for mission life is by 2028 to convert uh, about uh, 1 billion indians and other global citizens pro planet people meaning you know nudge them gently towards uh, you know uh, asking for sustainable products. Uh, so the, there are three phases in that. For the phase one is the demand phase. Second, uh, once th there's an increased demand, uh, there'll be supply phase where uh, we will see m much more uh, supply at the marketplace and then the, at the policy level, uh, policy change. So in three levels, and I think it's a wonderful uh, initiative at the micro level. We've all talked about macro level interventions, but at the micro level, I think this works. Fantastic. We've just got time for one or two uh, interventions from the floor. So uh, do we have microphones ready? Excellent. Um, Anya, I think, wanted to come in just from the previous panel, just over here. Yeah, just to answer your question, um, what you could do as a business is to put up uh, the uh, expected lifespan of the product. We know from, this is actually something they do in France, and we know it works. So if you are standing there buying your new dishwasher, you can see, well, if I pay this more, it can keep uh, two years longer. Then you are willing to buy that product. And uh, then you should have a longer reclaim right. So if the product in, in Denmark, we have the lowest, it's really bad. It's only two years you can reclaim your product. And we see a lot of products then going down after two years and three months. So if we had longer reclaim right period, like five, six, or maybe the whole time of the expected lifespan time. And in that time, you should be able to get um, uh, the things that would uh, be destroyed. You should be able to get software updates. That's also a big problem. You can have a very well-functioning television screen, but you can't get the software update. And it, gets, it runs down in two years again. So, uh, and then to answer the other part of your question, um, like bottles and cans in Denmark, in all supermarkets we can deliver used bottles and cans. And there's a value in this kind of waste, so it's recircled. But it's very easy for consumers to hand in their used bottles and cans. So make these circulation systems easy. It's just a question of having a value. So it's nearly 97% of all used cans and, and bottles goes back 
and, and, and are circulated. So it's not a problem if you see this as a climate value for everybody. Excellent. And time for, oh, do you want to very quickly? Just, just that I think uh, experience in, Dan in Denmark is really very, very useful and very important to, you know, uh, to take advantage. You know, maybe, uh, for example, all this uh, eco rating uh, that you, you, you mentioned, that we see that in many African countries, we have some uh, actions, you know, some plans, you know, to uh, develop, you know, eco rating, uh, measuring the sustainability, durability, repairability of, of devices and so forth. I think uh, so far South Africa is uh, doing something and then we are following so that it will be maybe be spread in other African countries because it's of importance for, you know, the, uh, the government. As I think also you mentioned on uh, packaging, yeah, because uh, so there was also this panel yesterday here on, on, on packaging. So we see that, uh, for example, again in South Africa, we have this uh, I don't know, extended uh, you know, producer responsibility whereby governments, importers, uh, packaging companies so are held really responsible of it. Yeah. Not also to, to forget to mention, so as a business, uh, for example, even in the device, to produce devices in Africa, so to reduce the footprint, so we are uh, supporting local manufacturing because we believe that uh, Africa can uh, produce high tech for Africa and for the rest of, uh, of the world, yeah? But by supporting local manufacturing, this is also uh, contribute to reducing, you know, the, the footprint, you know, the, the carbon footprint in, uh, in, in the world. Thank, thank you. And I did promise one last intervention, and I think a hand was raised here, uh, and this will be the final remark of the session. Hello, I'm Anita from uh, MGP India. Uh, I want to say that uh, consumers can uh, make small changes in their lifestyle to bring about the sustainability. Uh, they can uh, ask the producers for the mini minimum packaging uh, to avoid uh, fancy packaging and the pa packaging should be uh, reusable. Also, they can ask, uh, means consumers can go for the local products to avoid transportation. Uh, and uh, I want to say that uh, the designing of the electrical products should be universally uh, similar. Uh, so, uh, like uh, plug points or uh, chargers of the mobiles so that uh, you don't have to buy some more appliances to use those appliances. Thank you. Thank you. And, and oh, I, well, <laughs> Can I? If it's 10 okay. seconds. Yeah. Uh, what Anandita and Anita mentioned about the individual choices, to make them more comprehensive and uh, to spread, I think consumer organizations can go to schools and communities and offices and all to spread and pledge about all these action points. Uh, we in MGP, we do that. We take the opportunity to go to schools, colleges, and community uh, level programs. And we do tell about the sustainability norms that each and every consumer, right from young age to older one, should follow and make them pledge uh, about the garbage management and other things. So I think that also can help consumer organization can definitely contribute uh, to this point. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to, uh, we don't have, to, we, we don't have time, I'm really okay. sorry. We, we are just over time and I'd just like to thank everyone. As you can see, there's so much to cover in this. I think hopefully you've taken out some ideas for consumer organizations to take away, for businesses to think about, and for governments to think about. Obviously, we've got a really critical challenge that everyone is facing, a deadly challenge that we're all facing. We need to act fast. And so I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank the panelists today, both the ones on stage and the ones in the audience. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you.